Why he's writing off uh, the extreme right wing threat, I, I don't know. Um, it's not as well organized as Islamist terrorism. Despite most of Europe spending last three months in lockdown, the terror threat unfortunately hasn't gone down. We saw that in a recent Reading terror attack. We've also heard some concerned voices saying that MI5 and intelligence services are focusing way too much attention on right-wing terrorism and are overlooking jihadi terrorism. But how true is that? We spoke to Philip Ingram, MD, who is an intelligence expert, to dispel some myths and look into hard data. Why he's writing off uh, the extreme right wing threat, I, I don't know. Um, it's not as well organized as Islamist terrorism. Uh, it... uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, a couple of words, why you're here, your expertise. <clears throat> Um, I've got quite an unusual background. I spent 26 years in the uh, the military, uh, most of my career as a senior military intelligence officer um, and a planner, um, uh, before then getting out in 2010, uh, uh, going into the steel industry to have nothing to do with uh, military or security or anything else, but to learn about business. And I was the sales and marketing director in a, uh, a privately owned, um, very large steel manufacturer. Um, did that for three years um, before then uh, leaving to set up my own consultancy um, into security, marketing, uh, media. Um, and that, uh, the initial contract that I had was with a business-to-business uh, -business publication that I ran and was editor-in-chief um, uh, with. And I did that for three years before leaving it uh, as far as I could get it within the constraints that were given to me. And then set up my own um, agency, which is Grey Hair Media, providing uh, content in, in three ways. I'd say there's mainstream press content in the specialist areas of security, intelligence, uh, defense, uh, current affairs. The second is a business to business level of support, which is uh, ranges from content support um, uh, for business to business publications out to wider marketing and PR. And the third is um, conferences and putting uh, good speakers into high level conferences because my little black book of contacts is pretty good. Black book of contacts, I like it. <laughs> so, and you are here today to discuss with us uh, some recent articles and topics in the mainstream media. Um, yeah specifically about the terror attacks, most recent terror attacks in Reading. And there was some news, um, in particular Daily Mail article that I've, I was discussing with you, uh, saying that the police, MI5, are overlooking the jihadi terrorism because all resources are targeted on um, right-wing terrorism. Yeah. What is your opinion? <laughs> I'll, 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 st I'll start from the beginning. There's, if we look at the statistics um, across the UK, terrorism is a major issue. Um, up until about 18 months ago, a year, 18 months ago, uh, there were 23,000 people on MI5 and counterterrorism police's radar um, of all different sorts, but on the, uh, they, they had come to their attention for some form of terrorism. About... 18 months ago or a year ago, that was revised upwards whenever they really looked all through their files again to 43,000. Now that's, that's a lot of people. Um, of those 43,000, 3,000 are active subjects of interest, which means that um, there is enough information that the police and the MI5 believe that they are actively planned or are involved in terror-related activities. Now that's a very, very broad definition. But within that, there are 800 active investigations going on today. And that means that um, counter-terror police and MI5 are concerned about 800 individuals or groups of individuals that are going around um, uh, England, Wales, Scotland at the, at the moment and planning terrorist activities. Um, and therefore, when we see the numbers that actually happen uh, and, and that they're very small indeed, it shows that our... Uh, counter-terror organizations are having huge successes because they're keeping a lid on this. It's bubbling away beneath the surface. Um, and 
you know, that is something that we should be concerned about. And, and everyone says that, um, well, if one terrorist attack gets through, that's too many. Yeah. It is too many. But uh, you cannot, even if you apply every uh, resource that you've got in the police and the security services to counter terror issues, and you, you can't do that, you cannot stop it 100% of the time. The police, the security services need to be successful 100% of the time. Yeah. The terrorists only need, need to be successful once. And um, talking about, so in particular, talking about right-wing terrorism, yeah. what is the definition of right-wing terrorism? Um, well, there, there are, I'll, 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 I'll go through the, the, there's three different areas of terrorism. Um, there's, we'll start with the left. There's left wing um, anarchist and single issue terrorists. There's then uh, the ones that hit the press most, the Islamist related groups. And then there is the right wing terrorism. Now I'm focusing this on England, Wales and Scotland, because if I brought Northern Ireland into it, Northern Ireland um, is probably the terrorist hotbed of Europe with the number of activities that are going on. You know, as a very quick aside, um, it's 21, 22 years since the Good Friday Agreement was signed in Northern Ireland. Um, if you take the number of terrorist-related arrests in Northern Ireland um, uh, and terrorist-related incidents and divide that by the number of days, it works out that there has been a terrorist incident um, of approximately every four days since that was signed 22 years ago. That's so it a was, lot of terrorist activity. Was it a terrorist um activity or was it uh foiled plots or was it the um it, it it could range from everything it could range from uh shootings um undercar uh, booby trap devices terrorist related beatings terrorist related extortion um uh spreading terrorist propaganda so it covered that that covers the whole spectrum um when it comes to extreme right wing terror um we, we to put to put it into context um, and I saw the article in the Daily Mail where uh, Colonel Richard Kemp had turned around and said, we're taking resources away from dealing with the, uh, the, the, the biggest threat of Islamist terrorism uh, to apply to extreme right wing terror. Um, and the, the easiest way to counter that is to look at some of the numbers. Um, about three, four years ago, um, MI5 were only, and counterterrorism police were only responsible for Islamist terror. They were not responsible for extreme right-wing terror. That was considered a local policing issue. Um, at that time, counter-terror police had uh, 500 active investigations. Um, it was then recognized that the threat was increasing, and the threat's increasing across, not just across Europe, but across the world from extreme right-wing terror. And um, the government wanted to provide, a, to provide a more joined up response because it didn't sit within one particular police force. It had an international dimension to it and they wanted to make sure that they could deal with that. So they gave the responsibility to uh, MI5 and to counterterrorism policing to take control of extreme right wing terror. The day they did that, the number of active investigations that counterterror police UK were carrying out rose from 500 to 800. There seem to be some grey areas in how we classify whether it's left-wing terrorist or right-wing terrorist or jihadi terrorist. How do you forces classify that? And is there any it, statistics? The, is there any actual statistics that would say we are diverting resources from one type of terrorism to another? No. Um, and again, this is where the Daily Mail article was, I think, um, a little misleading because um, when it comes to dealing with terrorism, what you find, especially with the numbers that are in there, is counterterrorism police and um, MI5 and other agencies all sit down as part of the uh, Joint Terrorist Analysis Cell, JTAC. It's based in the MI5 building in London. Uh, it's multi-agency, so it gets everyone in and they sit down and they look at all of the cases, they don't care whether they're Islamists, they don't care whether they're right wing, they don't care whether they're left wing, they don't care whether they're individuals that they can't put in there. And they look at every single one from a threat perspective and they put them into a level of categories to see how big a threat they are. And it's then that they apply those resources to, that they'll apply it to the highest threat, no matter where that terrorism comes from. So you don't get one brand trumping another brand um, just because uh, you know, that happens to be the flavor of the day or the politicians are shouting about it. It's done purely on um, a threat to the public and to keep the public safe prioritization. Um, and, and it's done because there's only a finite number of resources. You know, if, 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 if you looked at 
Yeah, my my background as intelligence officer, you know, I commanded a unit in Germany that has special surveillance capability. Um, if you wanted to put 24-hour surveillance behind, and everyone says, why can't we have everyone on the watch list? Why can't they all be watched all of the time? Well, if you wanted to put 24-hour surveillance behind uh, an individual, um, you probably need about 30 people. Um, that, in salary alone, is 1.5 million pounds a year. Yeah. Now, uh, that's behind one individual. <laughs> Multiply that by the 800 active investigations, where you would hope that they've got... Um, all of, all of the, um, uh, everyone's being surveilled all of the time. That's 1.2 billion pounds a year. Now, these, these figures then come into discussions whenever you're, we, we talk about whether we should let jihadi and jihadi brides come back into this country again. Well, if a jihadi or a jihadi bride comes back into this country, you need to make sure that uh, that individual is not continuing to radicalize people. Um, and therefore you need to put that, the most advanced level of surveillance behind them for at least a period of time. And that period of time is probably a year as a minimum. That's 1.5 million pounds before you even start adding up equipment and other bits and pieces. That 1.5 million pounds comes out of the same budget that's funding our schools, that's funding our hospitals, that's funding um, our um, judicial systems, that's funding our roads, that's funding everything else. Um, you know, whenever we're looking at the moral argument, we have to recognize that we live in a, uh, a society that, uh, 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 whose economy is based on um, uh, you know, a flow of money that goes through it, and that's a finite flow. Now, it, it's been hit hard with the, the COVID pandemic that we're in at the moment, so things are going to get tighter. Yeah, so um, I think it is very important to remember that um, both the problem, problem and the solution are not, are not going to fit in whatever 150 tweets, digits that allow, you are allowed to post. Uh, and we tend Correct. to forget it. We, we tend to kind of generalize, generalize, generalize and just yeah. spew out slogans. So if you say that's the case, why would this gentleman in the article of Daily Mail, why would he say so? What's made him... Is, does he have some sort of set of data or what in your uh, opinion, no ri ri uh, yeah. um, Richard and I, 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 I know I know Richard well he's you know he has filled a, an intelligence role in the in the past um, th it's the argument that's going on in the press today where there's been a new national security advisor um, uh, appointed and Theresa May the former Prime Minister stood up in Parliament yesterday and, and criticized and said that he's got no national um, security experience whatsoever why should he be appointed um, in the military an awful lot of the senior intelligence officers that were put into different positions uh, were not professional intelligence personnel uh, they were the likes of Richard Kemp who uh, was an infantry officer um, uh, uh, and was put into intelligence role for, for a short period of time before coming out of it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people who do that then consider themselves as experts in analyzing statistics. And, and Richard um, tends to run a little bit of a political agenda um, uh, from the, 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 right, the, the right perspective. He's very, every time there's an attack that goes in somewhere on, on his Twitter account, he'll put, um, is this an, uh, another um, uh, Alo Akbar attack? Well, that, that, that cry itself is not a terrorist cry. That is um, uh, you know, so, something that is used within the, um, uh, uh, a particular religion 99.9999% uh, of the time in a, a non-terrorist related way. So he's, he's being deliberately inflammatory. Um, he loves in his articles to be deliberately inflammatory rather than look at the fact. Um, he's extremely pro-Israel um, uh, for all the right reasons because uh, an awful lot of people get the analysis of uh, Israel and Israel's position wrong, and he, he feels he has to defend it. Um, why he's writing off uh, the extreme right wing threat, I, I don't know. Um, it's not as well organized as Islamist terrorism. Uh, it can't be put into a label group as easily as um, a lot of non-professional intelligencers love to have. They love to be able to provide a label um, there and then. Uh, so that they can um, work out where it fits in, in their own mind. And un unfortunately, many of these groups, and especially the extreme right-wing groups, don't easily fall into a particular block. Um, and, and a lot of them have been around a lot longer than um, uh, Islamist terrorism. You know, the extreme right-wing terror has been uh, across Europe and, and across the UK for years and years and years. I, I remember uh, when I was in the military, you know, back in the, oh, the, the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, 
there, there being a lot of uh, investigations into into the military where there's extreme right wing terror um, related activity was being investigated. We saw only yesterday in the newspapers that the Germans have disbanded part of their um, uh, military, their, their specialist military capability. They're, they're almost their equivalent of the SAS because of extreme right wing um, beliefs that they find in a large number of the members that are in there. Um, so this is this is this is not something that's UK based. This is not something that's European based. It's um, internationally based, but it hasn't quite joined together as well as some of the Islamist groups like Al Qaeda and um, so-called Islamic State. And uh, if right wing terrorism, you say, is not so well organized, uh, how about left wing terrorism? And what is <laughs> left, your opinion? Left wing terrorism is. Yeah, left-wing terrorism is even less well organized. Um, and the, the difficulty is trying to provide a definition for it. Um, it it's easy whenever there is a wider political cause. This is where you know, the IRA in Northern Ireland during the Troubles was relatively easy because they had a political cause of trying to um, create a united Ireland. The, the issues are becoming more, more complex now. Um, Islamist terror is, is relatively easy because these individuals want to impose their extreme form of Islamism on not just uh, non-Islamic states, but also in uh, uh, you know, uh, Muslim states uh, across the world. So, so they have that, that single cause. Extreme right wing um, and extreme left wing, we, we, we get into sort of interpretations of cultural nationalism, white nationalism, white supremacism, um, uh, you know, I, I hate the other team because they're wearing a different colored um, shirt sort of organizations that are in there. And, and there's people will have um, personal beliefs, personal political beliefs, and then a small percentage out of those will then take that into some form of direct action where they're trying to um, uh, um, cause harm into different communities to highlight their cause and to cause fear and terror in those different communities. And it's working out where that turning point is, makes it very, very difficult for the police um, and for counter-terrorism uh, security organizations to define where someone has crossed the line between um, being uh, politically active in a free society, whether it's right-wing or left-wing, and becoming a terrorist. And this is where the, the terrorist legislation has continuously reviewed the groups as people pull themselves together are reviewed as to whether they have crossed the line um, to fall into that terrorist category. And when they do cross the line, they become prescribed and therefore become subject to the Terrorism Act. Um, and, th and that's constantly reviewed. It's reviewed on uh, you know, a, a very, very regular basis through JTAC into the government and recommendations are, are made as they see groups pop up. Around. So we spoke about different types of terrorism and we figured out that there is, I don't know, have we figured it out? Is there rise of any certain type of terrorism or it's even? Uh, terrorism as a whole across the globe, I would say is um, growing um, uh, and growing at a steady rate because we are seeing greater anarchy from different areas across society and we're seeing greater polarization in different in different countries and therefore that's a breeding ground for extremists of whatever terrorists in their flavor whether they are left-wing centrist or islamist um, or extreme right wing that flavor always changes over the years if we go back to the 1980s the major terrorist threat to uh, the whole of the united kingdom by a significant way was irish republican terrorism um, nobody had heard of Islamist extremism. Uh, then we get into the, the post-Gulf War and uh, the Good Friday Agreement to come in. So Irish Republican terrorism um, eases off. It still continues. And there is ex there's still um, uh, loyalist terrorism countering it in Northern Ireland, but it's, it's, it's put in a little package so the press aren't interested. Uh, and Islamist terrorism grows. Um, that got to a point where, with Islamic State taking over physical territory, where, where it uh, had reached a peak. Um, and is now um, at, a, at a steady level. Uh, that steady level doesn't mean it's gone away. Um, So-called ISIS are growing in certain other regions of the world. They're growing in Libya at the moment. They're growing in northern Mozambique. Um, and they're, they, they are expanding their influence across the world. Al-Qaeda 
who grew uh, at the 9-11 attacks in New York uh, with that spectacular uh, haven't gone away. Um, their leadership has changed when Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, but they're still trying to plan a spectacular. Um, on a, on a daily basis in their closed discussion groups, their encrypted groups that are invite only, there are um, tens of thousands of people across the globe on a daily basis in these groups discussing activities. Uh, and therefore the support is there. We are seeing a growth in extreme right wing terror as uh, nations become more polarized and we see the rise of neo-Nazism. Um, and, and that's being fueled by um, uh, a more inwardly focused global political situation with your Donald Trump putting America first and the extremism that we're seeing in there with um, uh, the uh, refugee crisis that happened across Germany and, and the growth of the political party um, uh, alternative for Deutschland, AFD, um, that is extreme right wing. But some of the supporters in that are, are part of um, groups that could be considered terrorist related groups. We see individuals that are extreme right wing having um, you know, huge successes um, in a lot of their attacks. You look, you look back at 2011 um, and Andreas Breivik in um, uh, Norway, he was extreme right wing, extreme right wing beliefs. He got hold of uh, uh, bombs and explosives. He killed eight through his explosives. He killed 69 um, through, um, and many children through uh, uh, a direct attack with a weapon. If individuals can do that, they tend to be very successful. If they could ever get together in a more coherent group, then they'd be even more successful. They have, the, thank goodness for us, the extreme right wing groups aren't like that. They're more thuggish in their approach. But their links to serious and organized crime is growing um, and they, you know, they, they need their funding from somewhere. And a lot of them are based on serious and organized criminal groups that, that um, occur across uh, Europe and across the globe. And it's that link that could give them the structures that they need to become more effective as terrorist organizations. And that's worrying. And what can we do here and now to alleviate the issue, to reduce the terrorist threat the, the, the here and now, it's very, very simple for you know, anyone that's um, listening to this or, or watching it. Um, you, know, you have a role to play. Um, it isn't just a policing issue. It isn't just a security services issue. It's a complete society issue. Um, and it's to recognize that the levels of extremism that are getting into this violence are um, unacceptable. You cannot justify them in any way, shape or form for, for any political activity, whether you disagree with the government hugely um, or disagree with another group hugely, it should never resort to violence. The people that tend to be moved towards um, violence um, tend to be in a position where they are groomed in a way. They have vulnerabilities and those other vulnerabilities. Um, and therefore, by ignoring something that uh, you perceive as a potential threat, uh, you are allowing potentially vulnerable people to be exploited. Uh, and therefore, the, the piece of advice is if you see something in, in your daily routine that feels out of place, that looks out of place, the chances are it probably is out of place. The chances are it is probably innocent, but let the professionals make that decision and report it to counterterrorism police or Crime Stoppers report it anonymously. You will not, unfortunately, get any feedback because it just doesn't happen like that. But as a former professional intelligence officer, I would far rather have had 100,000 reports of which um, uh, 99,999 of them were completely useless, but one of them was that nugget that stopped an attack rather than have none of the reports and that one nugget was missed completely and people died or suffered because of it. So we, we as a society must get into this habit of not being afraid to report something if we think that it is wrong. Um, and it's often, often it's a gut feeling. Well, I think we have no problems reporting things. During the lockdown, there were 200,000 complaints for neighbours having house parties or having friends around. <laughs> so I think we, we, we're pretty OK with that. Yeah, and, and, and none of those house parties and having friends around have um, resulted in um, explosions or shootings or uh, vehicles being driven into people or, or knives being used to kill people. Uh, yes, it's caused the spread of a virus. So treat, it in this, treat terrorism in the same way that we're treating the virus. Report, report, report. Well, thank you so much for sticking with us till the end of this video. 
As always, your opinion is very important to us. Leave your comments in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe because we've got plenty more where that came from.